are running, I guess. There we go. And hello, everybody. Clickety clack, electric light bulb typewriters, uh, vibrating gutchko cookies, and what are typewriters? It's all a long time ago. Here we go. Guys, project or token wordpress.com. Whoa, and the volume I've got goes there. Bloody. I need to my own cell phone over here by mistake. Oh, dear, dear, dear. There we go. Yipes. Come on. Mute. My mistake. My bad. Uh, I forgot to mute the live feed. I was monitoring some other stuff. Letting on. Anyway, we will stop our sharing and we will get rid of that. Um, no, pardon the chaos <laughs> that has begun in this live show. Um, our, we were going to have and may still have Joshua Swamidas on as guest. I sent him the links to all of the stuff and um, he has not uh, yet responded. It's possible there's been a follow up in some direction on things. So I, I didn't get any indication that the email hadn't gone through. And so uh, we'll just have to wing it. Um, so in the meantime, um, uh, Jackson, you can also keep an eye on the like few people that are in the chat. And there's been no discussion on there. This may be a day of doom. Altogether, so we'll we'll see what happens on it. Anyway, um, I will then spend a little bit of time before Joshua shows up. Uh, hopefully, he does arrive uh, on the uh, contested bones thing, which I'm continuing to do an analysis on. I put a couple links up uh, with Tim White's paper um, from uh, 2009 on uh, Artipithecus uh, uh, ramidus, and um, also a, a general article from Archaeology Magazine and then Ruby at Sanford cited that they basically were authority quoting stuff. They were cherry picking stuff out from the critics who were disputing the idea that uh, Artipithecus had a great deal of bipedality and that uh, it was in that hominid group. Uh, and uh, really very few people are saying that it was a direct ancestor of human beings. So that's kind of a side issue. But Rupi and Sanford see, see, they say it's not a human ancestor. Well, yeah, you need to read the whole papers to find out what the whole context is on it. Uh, hello, we got Old Scratch and uh, Falth. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're starting off with a mess because uh, the guest that I had uh, hoped to be planning here, I sent the e-links off to him. Um, uh, has not yet arrived, and uh, hopefully that will be arriving shortly. And if not, we're going to be winging it. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll fill you in on a reason why I was going to have a discussion with him. Uh, that um, he, uh, Joshua is with the BioLogos bunch. Uh, they're theistic evolutionists, and he has had run-ins and criticism from uh, Ann Gager and uh, Cornelius Hunter and uh, Miller and um, uh, Ev Evolution News generally uh, on the issue of whether or not there was a literal Adam and Eve. Is that agreeable with the genetics? Uh, there's another character that pops up, uh, Richard Bugs, who is an actual geneticist, but he's apparently, uh, if not a young Earth creationist, damn close. Uh, because he um, uh, is part of the Truth in Science bunch over in Britain, and they are largely full-blown young Earth creationists. And I um, um, analyzed them quite a bit in um, uh, uh, regarding the reptile mammal transition and evolution slam dunk. I will do shameless plug uh, with uh, ta-da. There's my book. And um, uh, Gager um, had a video where she was trying to invoke Swamidas as agreeing that. Yes, there wasn't an actual Adam and Eve. Well, if you look at it from a population biology point of view, there were lots of Adam and Eves in the sense that there could be many couples, men and women, who could be regarded as the genetic ancestors of everybody on the planet currently. And they would have lived at the same time. The problem is genetically, they would have been like half a million years ago. Uh, it's way off even our own species thing. And I don't think many of the defenders of this argument are arguing for a homo erectus Adam and Eve. Uh, they, they want a homo sapiens Adam and Eve in a Garden of Eden. And of course, the literal creationist model uh, has not merely that there is an Adam and Eve descending all possible people. It's that there, that all people today are exclusively and uniquely descended from only Adam and Eve, that there were no others involved. 
uh, or at the best you might have uh, uh, the Ross position kind of is that there could have been a population, but then Adam and Eve would be the first soulish humans and they become the ancestors of all people. So you have these gradations of rationalizations of the data uh, stream and uh, hopefully we'll be putting on, I, I put um, uh, Swamidas's website uh, up uh, and um, uh, the uh, peacefulscience.org uh, in addition to the stuff that he's done at uh, the, from the BioLogos part and uh, an interview that um, a British uh, skeptic or discussion that a British skeptic had had with uh, uh, Richard Bugs on his really doctrinally dig in the heels anti-evolutionism, including the fact that Bugs was insisting there's no evidence, no transitional forms in the fossil record. And I'm going, nya, 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 nya. no, that won't work. He's uh, not even on the new creationist train. Mm -mm. Yes. Well, 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 he's traditional fossils. Yeah. The, um, uh, yeah, well, I, I if, uh, uh, if he's typical, um, his argument would be that, uh, a kind of a, a qualified one, that modern population genetics and some of the arguments that were being used by, um, I think, Richard Venema, uh, if I mangled his first name. I know Venema is his last name, and he's with the BioLogos group as well. And he had written a book with another guy where they were arguing a variety of genetic reasons why uh, the literal Adam and Eve can't possibly be there. And Swamidas would agree with bugs that some of these criticisms that were being used against the literal Adam and Eve argument aren't really valid in terms of trying to use coalescence analysis and other ways of identifying whether or not there could be a, a pair far enough back in time. And that's the, the whole point about the chronology issue, that when you look at too many defenders of this Adam and Eve model, they're not really clear about the when part and the where part. And so um, uh, the Adam and Eve that can be regarded as air quotes, Adam and Eve, half a million years ago, maybe, uh, aren't anywhere connected up with a Garden of Eden or that they had to necessarily be in anywhere that would be even remotely related to any Bible story. Um, uh, they could be a population group that could have been in Africa. And um, uh, the, um, uh, the issue then it all gets muddled up. Uh, I, I would have liked to have had the perspective from uh, Swamidas on this because he's coming from a theistic um, uh, evolutionist point of view, and uh, I'm not, and uh, Jackson isn't. And uh, so far, we are coming along in the show, and we have no signs of our immediate guest. Uh, if he had been on Twitter, um, which I don't think he is, um, um, that um, um, I could have given him a direct link that way, but... Um, We'll have to uh, wing it. Anyway, there's a whole slew. If you want to see the infighting and hissy fits that can go on between the intelligent design camp and Swamidas, I don't know that he's had much interaction with the Young Earth Creationists or U Ross brand of things uh, so much. Uh, it's essentially mainly the intelligent design bunch. And one of the ones that, that I put on the links was Ann Gager. And uh, I was just bumping into her yesterday at Michael Denton's book signing. Uh, over in Seattle, because um, uh, I, 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 I took a while before I realized, well, wait a minute, I wonder if that's still Ann Gager. And uh, her reaction to things are very peculiar. She, I, I'd be mentioning, um, I was talking with her about Denton's books and, and the fact-checking problem, and uh, that clearly she hadn't bothered doing that. And she's, oh, you have some criticisms of him. And I go, oh, yes. <laughs> and... Um, uh, and when I would be bringing up things on the reptile mammal transition and how Denton had been so far from the data field. Uh, oh, uh, yes, uh, Jackson, the note you put up there, yes, that correct. S. Joshua uh, Swamidas. If you can find him on Twitter or some other areas to do a little backside connection, um, uh, welcome to it. Uh, the, only, the only one that I have was the direct uh, email listing that, uh, that we have. Anyway, um, I sure hope I got that thing because I didn't get a mailer demon on it. Um, oh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I dislike when when uh, a planned guest uh, isn't materializing and so that I have to kind of wing it in and wonder, was it some goof up that I had done for my end or not? Uh, so anyway, I, I, I'll put in a little thing about what I had done with Michael Denton uh, over on the coast. Uh, I was curious to see, uh, he's just come out with a new book on um, uh, water and how um, it, um, and photosynthesis light. This one is on light. That's it. That, um, uh, a very, a, a kind of, um, essentialist, um, 
uh, the notion that um, all of our photosynthetic and ability to, uh, to have vision are all based upon an incredibly narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is conveniently matched up by the amount of spectrum that's produced by the stars. And therefore, all of these things are kind of too coincidental to suit him. I called it Panglossian. Uh, attitude and, and he didn't particularly like that. But the, the fun part was when I asked him about the reptile mammal transition, uh, when he put it up for, for questions afterward, nobody was getting up. And uh, I, I thought that was sad. So I jumped up and asked my question. And he ended up functionally agreeing with me that the reptile mammal transition was a, a, a little um, a plausible natural phenomenon. He didn't really dispute any of that. And I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but for him, he doesn't care about all those little proximal details uh, because he's got his dig in the sand fundamental structure of the universe thing being favorable to life uh, as though human beings were like around from the beginning that we have this long process of, of, of natural evolution of where did it really, was it that providential or planned or intended or structured and and so he doesn't really know what he believes in, doesn't have a model functionally. He just has these kind of strange formalist platonic lines in the sand that he draws, but it isn't really helping the intelligent design argument anyway. Um, so we are still missing our other guest and um, um, 12 minutes into the show and we will find out uh, what is happening. He, he was doing uh, postings uh, on it uh, earlier in the day, uh, calling attention to stuff on his website um uh, that um uh, maybe um um in the uh, chat feed uh let me go get the information on that let me see where i've got my message board here oh dear 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 i dislike being um um things not working out quite as planned um we managed even to get kent hovind on the field and of course, with the now that the camera and everything, the system is going on the live feed, it hogs up memory and stuff. So I'm not able to to access information quickly. I just can't go zapping in and cut and paste and blah, blah, blah. Everything is as slow as molasses. So uh, I start looking hemming and hawing and stupid. Anyway, um, it, uh, there would have been a natural connection between the Rupee and Sanford approach, which is a young earth creationist model versus uh, the intelligent design fence straddlers, and then as a farther spectrum, the uh, Joshua Swamidas uh, theistic evolutionist, more generic Adam and Eve air quotes kind of thing, and uh, no conventional Noah or anything like that. That you've got a data field and you have to try to figure out what group is going to fit that um, data field better. Old Scratch says, you don't need a guest to fill the hour. Well, thank you so much. But nonetheless, I am frustrated that I don't actually have the, the guest that I planned because I, I was really genuinely looking forward to the discussion on it because it is a different perspective <coughs> uh, from um, um, the either Kent Hovind style creationist position to uh, the U Ross style old earth creationist position to the intelligent design. What is their position uh, down to... Uh, the theistic evolutionist thing, and then the non-theistic evolutionist spectrum. Uh, to my mind, the big issues relate to chronology and the extent to which um, the Bible or any religious document, it's not just the Bible, um, don't really match up with it. Um, they're, um, religions tend to kind of think that human beings have to be made in, and animals and things in general are made in big zots. So the, the designer comes along and takes clay and turns them into people or that makes a person, uh, the Babylonians had a, a kind of, um, oh, slave mentality thing where the gods needed to have a workforce. So the, um, uh, I think, um, uh, I can't remember if it was Eridu or whatever, it was the little god or Enki maybe that actually made human beings on like on a contract basis and the human beings, one of the, one of the flood legends, um, if anybody wants to read Dynamania and stuff, they can find a lot of the, the, the privies on it. But the, the flood legend that existed before Gilgamesh, um, the one with um, uh, Uptapishtim as the hero, I think, um, had a bit where the gods. Akkadian. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's about two or three different versions of the flood story before you finally end up with the the, the Gilgamesh one. That's that, that to some uh, there are probably bits and pieces of a lot of that filtered in. We don't really know how much of it um, was copied by what because uh, in the Bible because we don't have primary sources. But the thing is, is that the gods made people as a um, uh, a, a unpaid labor force, and they started getting rowdy and noisy, and the gods couldn't get any sleep. And so um, they ordered um, um, Enki or whoever it was to uh, um, flood the world and get rid of them because they just need a good night's sleep. <laughs> and he took pity on um, a, a pair and brought the animals and stuff on the boat uh, to preserve them. It, it, it's, a, it's a far more concrete and, and, and um, uh, in many respects, a humanly understandable but stupid explanation as opposed to the biblical version which has pared everything down one of the the writers on this a uh, guy named uh, Cohn, who had written um, a very nice analysis of, of the history and the biblical point of view and the typology aspects and theology mm -hmm. elements of the bible story and how it differed from the babylonian originals is that by the time they got to the babylonian captivity they were bumping into a circumstance where they really thought they had been forsaken by god but they had a covenant with god damn it how come they could be taken off to babylon so they had a they they really worked in the idea of a god who was very inscrutable that you didn't necessarily placate it that it didn't have to explain things to you it just did what it did and grin and bear it and do what you're told and uh, uh, that quality kind of shows up in in the aspect of uh, a God that uh, decides to repent of his creation. How can an omniscient God do that? They would have known what was going on. And so there's a lot of odd problems when you're trying to laminate the old folk tales that were knocking around with the Babylonians uh, in with a newer version of God that's kind of mutating towards the kind of conventional monotheism that we get well, yeah. uh, much later on down the road. I mean, the, yeah, jump the modern concept of God is, I think would be completely unrecognized by the original authors of the Old Testament. They'd probably be like, what the heck? Because, I mean, you yeah. look at the stuff God does where he sends angels to go into Sodom and Gomorrah to look for him because he doesn't know what's going on there. Uh, as opposed to today where they would say, well, he did know. If he already knew, why would he send people to go check it out for him? Yeah. You know, why would uh, he... And that, but he does the same thing with, um, uh, oh, uh, Brian says, I think my source methodology should be taught in colleges. And I, I say, not humbly, Brian, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, um, uh, the Tower of Babel story is exactly the same way. Uh, that um, he um, learns that the Babylonians have been building a ziggurat to heaven and he gets pissed off and worried about that. And basically says, boy, if they keep this up, there's no stopping them. So I got to confuse their languages. And there's a weird subtext to that, which is a creator of the universe that makes black holes and nebula and, and has omnipotent power feels intimidated by people who can build mud brick pyramids. I mean, this is, this is something seriously misplaced. Uh, with this structure, but if you think about the context of the people making all of this stuff, where they're coming up with folk tales, they want to explain why people t speak different languages. Of course, they're talking about just the local neighbors, because if um, ancient Sumeria was anything like um, Britain uh, in 1200, there were a whole bunch of different subgroups that were speaking largely incompatible tongues with each other. We're used to big pieces of real estate where everybody is speaking the same language, partly because empires make you do that so that, that everybody is speaking Latin because the, the, the Romans a, run things. A concept that is uh, lost on Matt Powell of all people. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't seem to understand, you know, that the reason why people are writing in Greek is because Greek had become the lingua franca <laughs> of, of, their, of their culture and uh, made use of all of that. But they had no notion of people beyond the pale. They had no idea that there were people speaking uh, of different languages like uh, oh, um, um, oh, Kuichi or whatever it is that the Inca speak uh, and um, um, the Wattle, uh, I think was the one that the uh, Aztecs uh, spoke and so forth, and everybody in China and all the rest. And uh, uh, it's fun when you get into um, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you'll be touching on any of it in the new Anti-Answers book, more plug 
uh, Jackson and I are, are working on a, a criticism of the Answers book series at Answers in Genesis. Nobody's really done this before. And he said, hey, would you like to write a book on this together? And I go, yes, that sounds fun. Because, All four of them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an area that no one's really tackled. Um, oh, old scratch then uh, says that if, if we teach source methodology in colleges, then the creationists would want to teach the bottom feeder method. Well, I know some great practitioners of that, that they could get. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Believe anything you're told. Don't ever contest me on what I say. I said no yeah, questions. Well, <laughs> um, I, I would in effect be, uh, if you've got in your college thing, uh, a historiography teacher's uh, you might have, I don't know all the curricula, what they have today of something that would be analytical source methods uh, elements, but I, I learned it in historiography class, which is the history of histories. And so if you have any um, uh, college uh, curriculum in that department in your own college, you've effectively got somebody that does that anyway, because you're dealing with source scholarship to look at how different historians have viewed the data field over time and how uh, different historians come in and out of favor. Uh, in the case of like the Roman Empire, when uh, Gibbon came on the scene and then, uh, oh, um, oh God, I've forgotten half of the historians that were writing on, on the various, uh, um, I'll started with a, a, a C, one of the ones in the 1700s. And um, that our views of history change over time in in the sense the same sense that science views change over time as new data accumulates and better interpretations come about and you test out models uh and so that in order to look at the history you're also looking at the history of the histories and so historiography is that little discipline and that's where i learned source methods where my historiography teacher said don't confuse primary and secondary sources you can get into big trouble that the goal of all rigorous analysis ultimately is to ground the thing in primary sources. And uh, if you don't have the primary sources available, you have to recognize that in your analysis, to recognize that you're dealing with, in the case of writing about Alexander the Great or, or Herod or Jesus, uh, you're dealing with people who are coming after the fact, not the person themselves writing things where they may have agendas that will alter the dynamics of it. Uh, okay, let's see who we got going in there. How oh, Sci Strike, hello friends. Yes, hello. Uh, Sci Strike. Uh, if you don't follow Sci Strike, you should, uh, because um, he is uh, a person that gives a portal to some of the most peculiar, stupid that you would ever want in uh, in dealing with uh, people who think the Earth is flat and all the rest. Sci, of course, does not believe any of that stuff, but has made it part of a mission of life and a laudable one to bring it to the attention of others so it can be hopelessly and shamelessly ri ridiculed. <laughs> I think one could argue it's somewhat sadomasochistic, <laughs> finding yeah, these well, videos yeah. and watching them with friends. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, it can have an enormously useful methods aspect because I got sucked into sci strike stuff from watching the various flat earth material uh, so now I know way more about the various flat earth pr pr practitioners that I ever paid attention to before I just knew there were some modern flat earthers but I didn't care anything about them because they were irrelevant I mean there's the still level of them that circulates among them is astounding yeah um, it, it's an interesting thing theoretically oh. it, as flat earth continues in the social media it'll be a fascinating thing to find out whether anybody above the idiot bottom feeder level ever actually ends up embracing flat earth. In other words, will it acquire a patina of, uh, of um, uh, solidity that say uh, young earth creationism or even to some extent uh, geocentrism still does. And uh, so that uh, it could you know, very well, we, we might be seeing the opening wedge of a time when there will be a more seriously and politically serious group where somebody who's actually in political office thinks the earth is flat and will and will talk about the prejudice that people have against uh, the flat earth and uh, you know we'd be here at the beginning of it and hopefully we're trying to nip that in the bud right here you know rj i actually have a uh i know a flurfer guy who uh also a uh, fun fun fact i just got an email from swamada says he will join in a moment Oh, great. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Flirt, I have a we may have for... to go over our hour then. Uh, because, uh, we'll let the conversation run uh, as it uh, means. So um, uh, I know a flurfer who I, better... I think you would enjoy talking to, RJ. 
you and Sai both probably. Mm -mm. Some of them may be perfectly amiable folk, and others may be the one where you one where you'd want to hit your head with a ball peen hammer uh, on it. Uh, let me put in before uh, since um, Joshua is going to be on his way. Let me do my shameless plug since it's f uh, almost a half hour into the show anyway, and so I may as well make do on this and get that obligatory thing out of the way where I will thank all the various patrons of the project and also put in my shameless plug for can rattling. Okay, we want to share. And so the infinite regress again. There we go. It's like time warp, isn't it? Uh, there's my uh, tip patrons. We've got Stephen and Mary Gale and Keith and Dyer and Andrew and Eat Neil and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen B and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Bo and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Cyrus, who is helping me work on the, uh, um, the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg audiobook and uh, Totes Real and Everett and Paul. Thank you very, 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 very much for helping. Uh, the uh, the website uh, that I have my stuff at is at tortukanwordpress.com. If you don't have that on your PC or on your smartphone, and I know you can do it on the smartphone, I got it on mine, so I know it works. Uh, and then uh, patreon.com is where these uh, generous people have helped the project, even though I have to caution that Patreon is stingy slow at actually uh, giving money to people. So is where these uh, generous people have the project. Whoa, we got a, somebody's got a thing on. Ah, oh, hello, so Joshua. If you've got the thing on the live feed, you're going to have to mute it. I, I made the same mistake earlier. Somebody's got a thing on. Ah, oh, hello, so Joshua. If you've got the thing on the live feed, you're going to have to mute it. The thing on the live feed? Yeah, yeah. If you have, if you have my picture, the, 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 the YouTube up, and you have the thing still running, it will give us feedback. I can't hear it anymore. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Excellent, excellent. As soon as he gets back into the seat. You don't, you don't have to feel bad about it, Joshua. I made exactly the same mistake earlier as I started the show up. I had forgotten that I had uh, uh, the, uh, the, the YouTube microphone open, and it was giving feedback on it. So, <laughs> And he has frozen up, possibly. Oh, there he is. There you go. All right, there we go. I see what, what happened. Can you guys hear me okay now? Oh, absolutely. Everything is wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I shamelessly started the show without you, and uh, <laughs> I've called attention to the fact that uh, I gave a little brief presses of the circumstance that you uh, had uh, gotten into a little um, a pitchfork fight with uh, the intelligent design community. I've got all the links up, not only of your various pieces and your website, uh, uh, the peaceful um, uh, uh, science uh, dot Board, but also a, a lot of the material from the critics so people can read the, uh, uh, like I would want to inflict Cornelius Hunter on anybody uh, and <laughs> Ann Gager and uh, all the rest. I bumped into Ann Gager just yesterday because she was over at the Michael Denton book signing over in Seattle that I intended. And uh, uh, have you actually physically met Gager? Yeah, I have a few times. She's a very kind, uh, kind woman. I mean, I would even yeah, call Yeah, very pleasant. Woman. Um, I had a weird reaction when I was talking the science technical material where they're like ALUs and that. And she would kind of go, mm, yes, mm -hmm, yeah, and, and not actually engage. <laughs> I was wondering whether you would find that same kind of experience, whether on some topics that she might not want to think about. Well, I mean, she probably doesn't know who you are, right? Oh no! I'd met her before. She remembered me because I had I had talked with her and we had exchanged email material uh, at when uh, in, or I think it was last year when uh, Jonathan Wells and uh, Douglas Axe and her were doing a um, uh, a lecture there at the same college. So and she recognized me on all that. No, I I just struck me that that there was a certain degree of kind of hmm, hmm, hmm and nothing in engagement. Well, you know the thing about science is is. But, um, man, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people you can put on the spot and they're going to say stupid things or maybe not respond right. I mean, mm -hmm. in the end, we're more concerned about really what the arguments are and yeah. it's being handled in an honest way that's accurate. So I think, uh, you know, I think Anne, uh, I disagree with Anne on so much of the science, but I've also found some common ground with her. Um, I think that she is doing her best to be honest about about stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I found that she was perfectly fine. The, the fact that she was sending me material by email, uh, the PDFs of stuff, it was very open engagement. And Douglas Axe uh, was pretty much the same way. Wells, he's a tougher nut to crack. He's not one that kind of engages on them. But anyway, that was a side issue. We wanted to get on to the to the the, the, the main attraction, which is dun 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 Adam and Eve and the oh, Union Genome. <laughs> yeah, and where and where we're getting on on things. I gave a general summary of the point that that uh, from what I was reading from your own postings and various others that we've got the human lineage going on all the way back into Homo erectus and through the hominids and that you can find certainly a, a, a pair of humans and you could probably find multiple pairs of humans who by the interbreeding and genealogical shifting, you could say that everyone on earth today is physically descended from that pair, uh, which is a somewhat different model than the traditional, just to take the extreme of young earth creationism, where they would say that human beings only are descended from yeah, that I, pair, I would, that were literally I, only I would one push pair. back on that to say that young earth creationism is not, as we see it, like for example, in Answers in Genesis, uh, you guys are probably concerned about it from a scientific point of view. I am too. Mm. Uh, but you should also know that I'm concerned about it from a Christian point of view too, from a theological or a scriptural point of view, that is not a traditional view of Genesis. Oh, I oh I agree completely. So uh, I wouldn't want to grant it the legitimacy of calling it the traditional view. So I think that's uh, I think that's probably a very recent view. If you actually look historically, uh, the notion that there's people outside the garden comes up over and over again in you know in theological history. No one is really. Uh, concerned about that unless we're talking about people who don't ever descend from Adam that are alive today. So that's like polygenesis, yeah. that's a problem. But um, but there's a, but the notion of people outside the garden that Adam's lineage ends up um, interbreeding with, that, that's that's not actually considered, you know, heresy or, or particularly foundational to the faith to reject. So yeah, I think part of what happened is just that, um, well, for some people, when they hear about evolution, it's a little bit like being caught uh, like a deer in the headlights, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think RJ knows all about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so they kind of jump to uh, to oppose it. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically now because this was about 150 years ago that Darwin proposes evolution, right? Um, but the antiquity of man was known about for a little bit earlier than that. I mean, they, they were, people were kind of finding, you know, uh, Neanderthal bones and stuff in, in the ground. Uh, so I'm speaking a little bit metaphorically because I'm also including people back then who who were getting a little bit surprised by it. And so it's not really exactly our context. And I, th I think uh, it's interesting because the way they responded to it is very different than AIG. People had no problem granting evolution in the animal kingdom. They had no problem with an old earth for the most part. The key sticking point was Adam and Eve, and they weren't insisting on sole progenitorship. They were insisting that everyone descends from them, which is a very different thing. Or uh, it also depends what you mean by sole progenitorship. Let me put it another way. They were never insisting that Adam's line never interbreeds with others. They were insisting that everyone descends from Adam. That's a subtly different thing. Does, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. The, the, when you look at it from a population genetics uh, point of view, you've got the, the, this this vast interconnecting web of things, so that you can find that that there's going to be lots of of individual groups that actually are going to be over time. All of those multiple ones are all ones that we are all physically descended from. Especially the farther back you go, uh, the numbers that that we're looking like that you were discussing, and I've seen in other literature uh, for any kind of coalescent model to have an air quotes Adam and Eve is like a half a million years ago. We're, we're, that pushes clear past Homo sapiens into Homo erectus and into what group was going on with with whatever what was going on, uh, where we still that's have a, 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 a yeah. So if you want to have like a genetic single genetic origin, then that's where you go, right? Yeah. But, but if you care about uh, more this idea that maybe we're not genetic ancestors entirely or even at all from Adam and Eve, uh, then it could be as recent as, uh, you know, six to 10,000 years ago. Well, 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 explain that with a little bit more, because that's the one that I find, diff I can't quite grasp how that would how that would work. Yeah, so it has to do with just a difference in the math and how it works. So there's a really good nature paper from 2004 uh, by Rhodes and, um, and Olson and Chang, I think it is. And uh, they did uh, they did a really in-depth analysis on it. It was based on some work that Chang at MIT did back, I think, in uh, 1999. 
Uh, so I reference that in, in a lot of my papers, but it, it turns out that uh, when you look at the math, uh, just think about how many ancestors you have, assuming that there's no interbreeding. If you go back one generation, um, RJ, you have you have two ancestors, right? If you have yeah. go back two generations, you have four, right? If you yeah, go back by doubling all that, it's clear that unless populations were ridiculously large in the past, there would have to be a lot of overlap. Well, more than that, I mean, if we actually look at the population sizes going back, we see it exponentially decreasing. Yeah. So we have like seven billion people on Earth right now, but you go back, uh, you know, two thousand years ago, I I don't know exactly what it is. Let's say hundred million. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back, if you go back, uh, you know, uh, five thousand years ago, we're talking maybe, like once again, I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm just gonna give some numbers. Like let's say maybe ten million, and then you start to be double counting ancestors um, more times than there's stars in the universe. So, so something's got to give, and what gives is that 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 our categories are collapsing, and that mm -hmm. at a certain point much more recently in the past than we would guess intuitively, either everyone alive is an ancestor of no one right now, or they're an ancestor of everyone right now. The, how, how has the, the new input, now that we've got actual DNA from Neanderthals to play with, and to some extent Denisovans, uh, throw some monkey wrenches into the calculations for just about everybody? It's a category error to think it would create a problem. I mean, we're just talking about separate things. It just means, actually, what I'll say is it's interesting reading the literature because uh, it's very often misreported. So people will say how, for example, that um, Europeans descend some, you know, descend from Neanderthals from an interbreeding event, but you know, people in China don't. They'll say things like that. Or Denisovans, we see those in, you know, in Southeast Asia, but but Europeans don't. Well, so that might be true genetically at times. Maybe, right? However, that's just totally false when it comes to ancestry from a, a genealogical point of view, we all descend from Neanderthals. We all descend from Denisovans. We all descend from Homo sapiens. We're interbreeding between all of them. And so it doesn't, it, it's just that we all mix, not all of us get DNA in the same proportions from them. That's the only difference. <laughs> Yeah, the the, uh, the this is going to be a much more interesting data field. The one thing that I, I've, uh, um, because I come from a historical background, I tend to think historically. So okay. I want to look at the things in chronological order and to try to make sense out of all of that. And the one thing that, that is, uh, I've always found rather uh, annoying from uh, the intelligent design camp and, of course, the young Earth creationist camp with their truncated chronology, but then the old Earth creationist as well, uh, uh, you, Ross, that I've interacted with on various occasions, is that they tend to kind of genericize it and not trying to place it into things happening in a temporal sequence and in regional sequences. And so I'm, I'm much more impressed with people who do pay attention to the fact that it looks like we've got these regional blobs of population and that maybe only a few hundred interbreeding episodes might have taken place between, say, Neanderthals and humans uh, in the early range of, of uh, Homo sapiens, and then trying to figure out how far back that was going. Uh, uh, are we having a species that's originating 300,000 years ago instead of 200,000 years ago? So I want to see the big picture details come up so that you can get a panorama of it. Yeah, so the way I would, I would say that the, what this does is that um, it legitimizes uh, or creates an opportunity, I would say, to legitimize both stories as important. Like, they're both how we rose. So imagine, I mean, like, you have two parents, RJ. I have two parents, right? My, um, my mother has an origin story. My dad has an origin story. They're both my origin story, even though, you know, you know they kind of cross over in me. Like, I have a son. I, I was born to Indian immigrants. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they, uh, I was born here in the United States. They just moved here from India just a couple years before. If they'd made a different decision, I would have been born in India, not here, but I was born here. Just uh, about five years ago, coming up on my fifth anniversary, um, my wife uh, was born several years later um, to uh, to an, a German immigrant who married an American here. Okay, and so like we both have different origin stories, but you know we have a son who has both of our stories. And, you know, we can go deep into the story of my wife and not until very late will it ever intersect with mine. Uh, I'll not even be mentioned there. And likewise, we can go very deep into my story 
And, uh, and my wife won't be mentioned there at all. It's to kind of come together and cross a certain point. So what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that um, uh, there's really exciting stuff, especially coming out of ancient DNA. I don't know if you guys have read um, Who We Are and Where We Came From from David Reich yet out in Harvard. Oh, I've, I've, I've read some of his technical papers, but I don't think I've read the book. I don't know if Jackson uh, has or not. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a, it's an Very important sad. book to read. It's really well written, easy to read, getting into uh, what we've been finding out from looking at ancient genomes. It's the story of us. It's the story of how we got here. It's it's not something that's owned uh, by science or by atheism or by any government. It's 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 for all people. It's like the common story that we all share, right? We need to welcome everyone into that in a way that uh, is not going to attack deeply held beliefs, you know, if we, unless we absolutely need to be honest with people. And, you know, some people need to, uh, you know, find a way to understand that Adam and Eve was one parent, and then this was the other parent that came together. Why not? Do we, uh, uh, I, I was curious because of all of the, the people that were involved um, with the discussions that you would have with Gager and others, but there weren't any people involved uh, with the Young Earth creationism. Was this because there had been no outreach to them, or was there an attempt to do outreach to them? Or uh, because there are some uh, Jeffrey Tompkins is a geneticist, and uh, I'm, yeah, I, so, I'm, so I have come to have a lot of empathy for you're talking about with me reaching out to Young Earth creationists, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the people connected up, any of them, uh, to see how much, how how broadly ranged did they want to bring in input? Um, so, like I said, so I'm a little bit lost. So you're asking me specifically of how I've been engaging younger creationists or just how they're responding to it or? Oh, whichever, yeah. whatever your your insights are on that, because I'm I'm coming from a very different background. So I'm, I'm just trying to find out what the things are. Yeah, so I'm... If it's not clear, I'm a Christian, that if, but I affirm evolutionary science. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not a young Earth creationist. However, I was raised by young Earth creationists. I was raised young. Oh, that that's intriguing. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, where did uh, and this was in India? No, it was here in the United States, and I was born and raised in Southern California. So. Oh, oh. Uh, so did they had come. Did they encounter this? Just piques my curiosity, Joshua. Uh, uh, did they uh, come upon like like answers? Uh, well, this would have been way before Answers in Genesis. This would be like in the Henry Morris era, like 60s, 70s, or. So I would say that they were a little bit more uh, traditional uh, younger traditionists. That's probably far more common than, for example, Answers in Genesis. They didn't precisely care. Or think it was important. They just thought it was a young Earth. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, the, the the young Earth creationism started to become much more prominent as a conceptual frame in the '60s and '70s, and and it then kind of hit a big feel in the 1980s. Yeah, and you know, we we would go. We were kind of swimming in this world, and you know, I have family members that have become very much like AIG creationists too. Um, but when we were raised, I mean, like I'd say the. There's a large number of young earth creationists. I mean, I'm giving a talk out in Hong Kong real soon. There's a large number of young earth creationists in China. There's a long, large, large oh, number. It goes to the evangelical network. Uh, yeah, and uh, you've got. Evangelicalism, per se, it's sort of the house church network, right? And mm -hmm. then um, and also in India, too, there's a large number of young earth creationists. And it's not because they've rejected science, it's just that, uh, you know, atheism in China is associated with an oppressive government. Mm -hmm. It's more of a cultural thing, his, a cultural historical thing for them, is it? And you know, they. I mean, the thing about it is, like, if I mean, if it's like a totalitarian government, all right. And, and I'm not, athe this isn't what all atheism is, to be clear. There's. And, I mean, you don't have to tell us that, but <laughs> well, I don't want you to know that I'm not attacking you with this. But no, yeah, we, get, we no, we we totally get it. <laughs> yeah, and the, the Chinese in particular, they're they're embroiled to this day, and just had a, a kind of semi agreement. Uh, with the Pope over the fact that they want to have control over uh, who gets to be bishops and who gets to be priests and all of that. And I, on this one, I, the atheist, tend to take the side of the church in that the, the government should have no yeah, right to be able to say The reason why a lot of atheists are anti-religious and anti-Christian is because what they see in the United States is a lot of uh, dangerous mixing of religion and politics and with power being used in horrible ways. So I think to uh, many of those of you that are honest in your camp, when you see atheism being abused in that way too, you're just as angry with that, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, talking whether you're talking about the 
the Chinese today or the oppression of you know, the Greek Orthodox people in Russia during the Cold War. You know, yeah, so I Soviet think that's actually how like we need to start defining it um, more than a, about, you know, atheism versus religion or whatever. We're talking about how, you know, people who are going to be using power well. And yeah, right. I did a, a, a piece, of, oh, it's been a few years ago, where I had seen um, the, the, I can't remember whether it was American Humanists or, or some organization like that. They had compiled a list of the various places on earth where you could get into trouble by either being a non-believer or having the wrong religion in that culture. And then I thought, I kind of wanted to connect it up to population. So Pew Research had done a huge analysis of how many believers there are in various countries. So I plugged those two together and determined that about three, uh, about two thirds of the planet, billions of people live in places where you can get into trouble or be killed for not having the correct belief or having no belief at all. And that's not good. <laughs> yeah, so this is where where I think the rhetoric needs to change. I think, so, in my opinion, um, where we we have to stop thinking about this in terms of just America and zero-sum games, but really start trying to forge common ground based on common values so we can live in a common society. And that means yeah. that it's going to be, you know, religious communities standing up for atheists when they're abused. And it's also going to mean atheists standing up for Christians when they're abused. And Yeah, it, it's the freedom of conscience. That was, uh, I, I called it a, a global um, secular conscience thing, where uh, one would be that it would be illegal to be have blasphemy laws. That um, if a god wants to come down and complain about somebody doing blasphemy, <laughs> and dandy, but the state yeah, should never do that. Laws, I think, are just so such a small version of God, like God doesn't need our defense if he's real. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, I, I think what was uh, Ricky Gervais, this is a blasphemy law is, is what protects God from having his feelings hurt. Yeah, it's funny, like, uh, so uh, you've seen uh, my forum at Peaceful Science, and, you know, I hope you guys come and participate too, but it's, it's, it's been interesting. There's a lot of atheists that are kind of chilling out there and having fun. Maybe some of them are even watching. I don't, I don't know if any of them are, at, you know, are like putting any questions that are not. Oh, yeah. Key, and, and Jackson, you keep your eyeball out for anything popping up in the live chat there uh, that's that's relevant. That's uh, Because when we're getting in, in, engaged in conversation, it's often difficult to leap on over and to keep what was going on in, in the live chat going. Well, so far, I saw, we haven't I saw really your, had your, uh, your notification that you put out earlier. Thank you, Joshua, for, for alerting everybody that we're going to be having the chat. And so I hope as many people in your gang uh, can come in as well. And uh, I g did give the, uh, the the live chat link as well, so that yeah. And also look at the around. forum uh, too to see if anyone puts any up there. I'll, I'll look at it too every now and then. But yeah, but basically, it's been interesting to see that where you know we were trying to find common ground for people who really disagree, and part of that is like Christians that disagree. And so that's why we host conversations with people from intelligent design. It's part of how mm -hmm. I became friends with Ann Gager. I mean, I think there's more than enough to criticize. Um, about the scientific stuff that there's no need to go uh, personal with people and attack them. And, and especially in this time when there are far too many cases of people getting personal too quickly and too intensely in so many different areas that uh, uh, we live in dangerous times and we want to make it less dangerous. Right. Uh, yeah, well, getting back to the whole blasphemy thing, it's been interesting a few times. Uh, like, there's this thing that atheists do when they're in a place. They're trying to test their limits to find out if they're really accepted sometimes, I think. <laughs> and they'll start posting totally blasphemous stuff. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, such as? Well, I think one oh, of them uh, declared a blasphemy sun Sunday and started posting some totally offensive stuff. I've blocked I mean, it out of my the heck of it? Huh? Like on, on Twitter, just for the heck of it? No, on my forum. Mm. Oh, well, I mean, I, you can always boot them. You know? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what people expected me to do. They expected me to get angry, to freak out, but that's not what I did. I said, you know, that's what you need to do. Like, nothing happening here is threatening my faith or the God that I know. Well, I mean, I would argue, you know, it's your website. You can just lay out the rules and say, hey, guys. Let's focus on science or, you know, whatever, what have you, and then say this sort of thing isn't really necessary here. There are yeah, other places that's you like can... using power that maybe isn't necessary. So maybe I can mm -hmm. do that, but I want to do that very reticent. Personally, I wouldn't blame you, I don't think, for doing that. I, well, I generally... 
I don't generally edit. In fact, I, uh, uh, at uh, my tip website and also on the various videos that I do, I never delete anybody's comments. And I figure if somebody wants to come in and make a bloody fool of themselves <laughs> and proclaim just exactly how oh, no, scurrilous they are, I'm happy to have it there forever in the internet so everybody can see. Well, you know, and but, but, but here's the thing. That I think that missed out. That misses out an opportunity. So what happens, I let it go. And I said, okay, uh, Patrick, uh, that was the guy who did it. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can find it online and Google it. You doxed him. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and I said, Patrick, can you at least explain to people why you're doing this um, so they can understand? Because you're just confusing them. You're making a point, but they have no idea why you're doing it. <laughs> right. And, you know, we kind of had some conversation to explain it, and then he decided to declare the whole thing over. <laughs> so, sounds like you beat him. <laughs> well, you know, I think I, I actually get it. I think atheists, uh, you know, Dan Eastwood, who's a uh, who's an agnostic atheist, who's one of the moderators in our forum. He uh, he mentions all the time about how a lot of times atheists. Uh, are uh, refugees from religion, and I and I think that makes sense because, uh, in our context, at least historically, I don't know if it's true right now, but uh, there's been a lot of religious people in power. A lot of and you know, religious people have not always used power well. And yeah, well, just demographically, the... most people are religious, so most atheists come from religious households. It's like, duh, I didn't come from a religious household, so I'm I'm atypical. But most of the people that I bump into in atheist clubs and on Twitter and others are ex-religionists. So they have a very different background than I do on that. So it, it, it comes with the territory that there's going to be a certain amount of, of resentment and frustration. And in some cases where, where people's personal experiences are becoming the out group makes them anathema. But that can occur with one religion switching to another or or as was the case exactly. in the Soviet Union and so where, I guess I'm, where I'm very religious sympathetic. people were persecuted. Yes, yeah, so I'm very sympathetic to that experience because I think a lot of times those injuries are very real and uh, there, it was real wrong done. And I think that's worth acknowledging. I think that's a voice that needs to be heard even by religious people. Yeah. The, so, the French Revolution was another example of that where they were on just an anti-religion kick yeah, and 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 it backfired on them in disastrous ways, and it, and that had a backfire effect in the sciences, where a lot of the new geology that was coming along in the early nineteenth century uh, uh, got shunted aside because conservatives in England didn't want to adopt it because those French Revolution people were supporting it, and Lavoisier gets his head chopped off, and and uh, um, oh. Uh, um, the other fellow who uh, fled, um, yeah, it's Priestley, um, a skedaddle from Britain because he was thought to be too much of a free thinker, Unitarian, pro-French revolution, drove Jefferson and uh, Adams apart in their friendship in part over this. So uh, it's nothing new. The people who take their religion or anti-religion way too seriously get in the loggerheads when they try to enforce orthodoxy or lack of it. Yeah, so that's where, um, so getting back to the original story about kind of how I was raising a creationist, <laughs> they were young creationists, uh, like in China, like I said, you know, it's the other way around where it's actually atheism with the power, mm -hmm. using it against people, and and it's not an honest government all the time. And so oh, you know, maybe you guys <laughs> would all be young earth creationists too if you were raising <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you see that where um, uh, so I, I tremendous sympathy. Uh, the, the, the same situation has popped up in the old Soviet Union. I, I my view is that religion is an extremely natural things for humans to do. It's it's a way of explaining the world. We're we're storytelling species. Religions are a subset of that. It's never going to disappear. We do it naturally. And so the idea that uh, I sometimes joust with some of my atheist friends who imagine that that if just people had enough information that we're all going to have this wonderful religion free society. No, not unless our brains evolve into a different way that we do this a lot. Yeah, so, RJ, what you're talking about is, say, is something called tolerance, which is a really important value <laughs> that we see in short supply right now, where. Yeah. Um, um, I of, uh, imagining a world that's perfect because we've eliminated our opponents or imagining a world where we can live together with people who disagree with us. That's a different view of the world. And I think that's the right view of the world. And I think that that's probably more important than a lot of the ways we have usually divided on these things. If the you had a world in which there, there were no religion, you probably wouldn't have box music. 
If you had a, a world in which there's no free thinker atheist, you wouldn't have Brahms's music. So I think we get <laughs> from people having a lot of things. And so the idea that there should be no coercion, I'm, uh, I'm the uh, uh, atheist blogger at the Spokane Faith and Values website, where they have a very ecumenical, although not hyper conservative. That's the one group they've never been able to bring in to the fold as the groups are, are a conventional creationist conservative Christians. But they've got a, a bunch of different denomination of, of Christians across the field and Jews and there's uh, Muslims and Sikhs and I'm the atheist and, and we have uh, um, uh, get togethers and bloggings and uh, uh, communication back and forth on things and enjoy each other's company and that and all without any pitchforks out. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's uh, I think that's a really important thing. Uh, I think I think what you'll find actually is if you actually get an opportunity to engage some of these more conservative Christians that don't care about the debate as much, you'll find they might agree on a lot of the headline points, but they're not actually going to stake the ground on it. What's going on is that we haven't actually encountered science yet, or or this evidence, or maybe just. Uh, they've been blocked from being able to see it because, you know, just the trusted voices didn't really show it to them. But it's not actually the fundamentally core thing for them. So they're very, um, they're, uh, they're very, I found them to be very reasonable people. Like I said, they're, they're kind of my people in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> um, this is kind of the people I grew up with. And, uh, and you know, if, if you can explain how to make sense of this in the context of their values, they're actually really able to come into the larger conversation. And uh, that, that's really one of the things that we're trying to see happen through peaceful science, to kind of create a common ground place that's trusted where people can come and hear about this. Yeah, because for one thing, people can learn from each other in so many different ways and realize there's more perspectives to things. It's not a matter of trying to convert people from one position to another, but by learning more and seeing more, for my, my methodological, uh, rather than being a Methodist, I'm a methodologist. So the idea is that, that the main thing is, is you've got this data field and the goal is to make as much sense of it as possible. And so you can take whatever viewpoint, hypothesis you want, but you've got to pay attention to the data. And your goal should be to try to explain things and do it usefully. And at no point hit anybody overhead with a brick bat for disagreeing with you. Yeah, and I think that that's great. And well, the, here's where I think there's something you could actually do some good on, on this whole Adam and Eve issue, uh, which could actually really help to help us start building a common society together on this. So one place uh, where I think it's actually a matter of integrity is a lot of religious people have been told falsely that, uh, that what they think is important in the Genesis story is false. Now, maybe the Genesis story is false. I'm not going to try and demonstrate to you that it's true. That's actually not the point. <laughs> but I don't think uh, it's right to tell people that we have evidence against what they deeply care about when we don't actually have that evidence <laughs> um, and we can't actually demonstrate it. And I think we have to be a lot more careful about that because I think it creates an unnecessary conflict. And yeah, I think it's way bigger than um, being a Christian who cares about the Christian community. I think this is just something about the integrity of science. We want science to be a place where when we're wanting to be taught in public schools, it's really being taught in the most, you know, religiously neutral possible way. So it's not actually, you know, something that can be legitimately called like an, an atheist plot to take over the world, right? It's just- well, This is actually relating to the issue that, that will incense Jerry Coyne, uh, which is the accommodationist uh, issue is what he calls it. Uh, well, I have no problem we- with telling people that what you think is important does not fit the evidence. I'm fine with that. What I'm not okay is saying that when there is actually no evidence against it. Yeah, there, there are several areas. I, I'd agree with you that in a lot of the, the, the matter of how Adam and Eve are defined, that uh, Venema overstepped his argument uh, and, and that they were, they were taking arguments that weren't necessary. One that I have made a, a couple videos on uh, is the origin of life issue. I keep on cautioning people, oh, be careful how you go into this. There's some people I, I see on Twitter where they say, no, we figured out how life originated. 
No, we haven't. No, no, we have lots of interesting clues, and I suspect it's a natural phenomenon, but no, they haven't figured out how membranes form and how the genetic code developed and all of that. Consciousness is another area that yeah. is still a, a, a big open area, even though we now know much more about the data field. But yeah, there's a bunch of these little third rails uh, in, the, in the field that by people putting all of their effort into that point, I had to give it the term, origins are bust. No, well, you know, don't What's go going on is that science is ceasing to be science at that point. It's starting to become a weapon that we're trying to use to win a cultural or intellectual yeah, yeah, war. Yeah. And I think that's deeply disrespectful of what science is. And it does far more damage to science than, I mean, if you care about science, you don't do that. Because uh, at, at the core of science, science only works if we're honest with people. And we realize it's something that's here for the common good. And so I, I just don't think that we can tolerate that. We can't say that it's like a bad argument for, a, you know, something that's ultimately good. You know, that, that, that's not how science works. And ultimately, yeah. that's part of, uh, of, of the source methodology approach is that, yes, you make your position, but ultimately, it's it. what sources are you relying on? How do you vet them? What standards of evidence do you use? Uh, do you uh, accept the idea that you can be proven wrong? What would that look like? And so that there's a genuine interplay in working out the thing rather than the dogma of coming in and then cherry picking just the quote from whoever that you particularly prefer that fits what you want to be true. Well, I, mean, I don't disagree with that, but I think there's something bigger here, right? So what I would say that there's something so much more grand here and big, and that's the, the you know, in a way we're kind of, I sometimes feel like tussling and wrestling, sometimes in a frustrating or, you know, maddening argument maybe it's some people like you clearly seem to like it rj <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, a conversation is a contact sport for me yeah and you know I, to be honest i don't mind a little bit of disagreement there too but a lot of people get put off by that but but what's going on though is that's like an argument i would say in the presence of something truly grand uh what is that grand thing i think it's the grand questions that, that we don't actually have settled answers for things like you know what is consciousness how did life arise? Why is there something rather than nothing? And yeah. ultimately, what does it yeah. mean to be human? <laughs> these are not, uh, these. anyone who thinks they have a settled answer to these, or even how humans arose, these are, these are grand questions. They're deep questions. We were meant to be gathered around, disagreeing in community about that, and uh, and being honest with another about what we think and also what the evidence is showing us too. I'm not trying to say we give up on honesty. No, it, it, that, that, that's the thing because in the history of science, many of the things that we now look back on as like, oh boy, did they overstate their case are precisely because people were basing from a very limited data set. Eugenics is one of the disastrous matter of where in retrospect, you're going, you have no clue how genetics is working. Why are you making these eugenics pronouncements when you don't actually even know the mechanism of inheritance, let alone homeobox genes? And so uh, the, the, the things that we look back on, all the debate uh, in the human evolution issue, Issue, the single species hypothesis versus out of Africa the, uh, and the, uh, uh, um, uh, and the uh, multi-regional approach where you had these fist fights going back and forth or in the bird evolution case uh, where they were thinking either it's got to be uh, trees down or a uh, ground up. And it turns out it's more intricate than that. There's usually a multiplicity yeah, this of- This is actually the big things. thing. So most people never experience science. They just experience science class, right? Most people never experience science, they just experience science class. And in science class, it's a whole, it's like a whole prefix menu of set answers that you're supposed mm -hmm. to get. Yeah. But when I became a scientist and you know, you experienced this, I experienced this first when I was an undergrad starting to do research. And then, you know, full force when I during my PhD. And then now I mean I'm a I'm a, I'm a associate professor running a science group at a leading institution now. It is I mean, there, there are answers to be clear. I'm not trying to say there isn't answers that we don't, I'm not saying we don't know things. I'm telling you, we are occupied exclusively with questions, it seems, or entirely by questions. Like that's what the beauty of science is. It brings us yeah. into grand questions that where um, we find grandness in questions that everyone else thinks is small. <laughs> well, and some of them inevitably, the one that I, I like to thumb my nose at, watch out, don't, don't jump off this cliff. Uh, in, in cognitive neuroscience literature, the qualia problem isn't just a tricky one. 
it's intrinsically it's unsolvable. There's no experiment you can devise to figure out whether you and I are perceiving the same color red. We can measure wavelengths and we can look at what neurons are doing and we can look at what the cones and the rods are doing in the eyeball and we can do all sorts of empirical measurements. But that sensory experience is internal to us and we have no way of plugging a, a cable in to be well, able yeah, to so, share that. So my scientific work, I do a lot of computational biology, but we use artificial intelligence and machine learning. So actually my PhD was in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it's interesting to see how that's kind of rising into prominence now too. Uh, you know, Alan Turing talked about the Turing test, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, like right now, we have so little understanding of what consciousness actually is that we don't know um, if it's possible to build a machine that's conscious. We don't know if it's possible how to build a machine that's conscious. And if we were to build a machine that was conscious, we wouldn't have any idea of how to figure out if it was conscious or not, or just emulate. Yeah, especially if it's an emergent phenomenon. I mean, I, I even think, uh, I, I may be wrong on this one, whether or not the physicists have finally got an answer to it, but the, re the, uh, the point is that why does water feel wet? There's a whole <laughs> bunch of things about it that you can know. Uh, 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 Alan question, Alda was bumping into the same wet. phenomenon of where they have these great questions issues where kids will come up with a question for the scientists. And it's the scientist's job to be able to explain it in such a way that the kid understands it. And these are things like, like why do flames do what they do? And it turns out that those are, in fact, immensely complicated questions. And so uh, it's beyond just combustion in that. And it forces the scientists to rethink the fundamental things that maybe they're taking for granted that are actually extraordinary issues on themselves. Yeah, so that's that's what I think the beauty of, I mean, that's a, that, you know, like if, if you care about science, um, you don't want to overstate science because what you're doing is you're robbing people of the opportunity to answer the questions. And so, mm -hmm. That's that's the true danger of pretending like the origins of life problem is solved. I mean, maybe it is like you know, purely by natural means. Like, I mean, if atheism is true, clearly it was. And um, but, but you know, maybe not. Maybe God did it. You know, I mean, that's not a maybe. scientific claim. Couldn't you say? Couldn't you say like maybe God set the universe in motion and then life came sure. about naturally afterwards? Kind of a deistic approach. Yeah, the, the Newtonian yeah. clockwinder. I, I just don't think we know exactly, right? Um, we certainly don't know from evidence that way, one way or another, and and that's fine. I mean, I mean, science has some methodological limits. We're only going to be looking for a naturalistic solution. We're not going to consider God. That's the way. It be. Here's one I want to throw out to your to your people to take a look at uh, in the in your uh, 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 organization where they can they can compare notes on it. I have tried to put a new wrinkle on Stephen Jay Gould's non-overlapping magisterium argument that okay. tends to get this terrible fist fight between Jerry Coyne on one side who thinks it's absolute crock and then a lot of creationists and intelligent designers don't like it either because it seems to restrict the religion thing. And I, my argument, I did a, a posting on it. Uh, I did a lecture on it quite a few years ago and I have the posting of it up on my website um, where I said that, that Gould drew, drew the line in the wrong spot, that it is not between science and religion. The dividing line is between decidable and undecidable propositions. And decidable propositions are empirical things that science can deal with because you can work out what sufficient evidence is. Over on the undecidable side are anything where you can't work that out. These are all normative issues, all ethical things are presuppositional. You have to work that out and, um, and you work out by what you want to believe and then to see what the consequences are. You can have a certain amount of utilitarianism, but you can't prove it in the same dynamic as you would science. And the problem is that too many people on both sides of various debates start jumping across the line without realizing that they have. And so they're trying to prove uh, a, a normative things through some scientific means or taking normative things to try to dictate what's going on in the in the empirical side and whoop, you're getting to mess that way. That's my, my thing. And so hopefully some people will read that and, and oh, yeah. I'll, I'll look at it. it. I mean, I think I think what I appreciate about what Gold was doing is that he was really trying to find like a way to coexist. You know, once again, I think that idea of tolerance, and I hear that in what you're saying too. I think the actual details end up being pretty complex on how to actually map that out. I think better than thinking about it in terms of non-overlapping magisteria, which is what he was saying. And I think you're just trying to say he divided, he did the the line wrong. I think maybe a better way to do it is to think about it as a conversation, like a constructive dialogue. 
So um, it's not that we're not talking about the same things. Sometimes we are, but maybe we're talking about you know the same things in different ways. And there's actually a real value in having like a real conversation where we legitimize both you know mm -hmm. theology. Well, and that theology. that qualia example is a perfectly fine one. Even if the the thing that causes us to perceive red is an absolutely mechanistic, totally naturalistic, not magical in any way, shape, or form, you still can't tell whether your perception is the same as mine. So there is an undecidable quality in what may be an entirely mechanistic natural system, uh, just as there will be well, issues in- I mean, I get what you're saying, but you know, remember, I'm just coming off the heels of a, an entire year dealing with the science of population genetics and Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you, people have been saying for 150 years, the science has settled this, that we know that X, Y, Z, is not possible or you know not like and it, it just turns out to be wrong i mean it like it was well settled and the reason why is just because uh you know it's a subtle complex question you know and yeah. it's complex on the scientific side it's complex on the evidential side and it's complex on the theological side of what's being meant and you know you really have to sit down and listen and really ask what actually are people meaning here and what actually is the, the evidence showing and then you find out that actually it's not nearly, um, I mean, it ends up being, you know, that the, the larger narratives have been like a narrative of conflict that was really not necessary. I mean, none of it was really necessary conflict. And, and I think that there's been real, uh, there's been real fallout from that. Well, it does pop into it in, in, in other way. Uh, and I think uh, uh, a side issue would be the Noah problem, because there we have a much more direct bottleneck uh, model that is a little bit different from the way the Adam and Eve model can be worked through metaphorically. Uh, but whereas Noah, the idea that all current people and animals on Earth are physically descended from a yeah, small so once population. Again, that's like a very uh, novel view of, of reading Genesis. Like, I, I don't think that that's actually the traditional view. So um, No, it, it, uh, it's probably fair to say that there was just not a lot of thinking much about it. That uh, um, the, the the writers no, for no, centuries that, like, you know, when people a great deal about that chronology. Well, so let me tell you. So from this, I'm speaking from a theological point of view right now. Um, so the issue of Noah is ultimately, I don't think, going to be as important. So yes, it was very important for uh, young Earth creationists in the 1800s. It was very important for the Genesis flood. It's kind of where Ken Ham is staking his, you know, his, uh, you know, flag in the ground. But um, but there is a couple things that make this actually not actually sustainable. Uh, one is that uh, that um, this Genesis it, when they wrote Genesis, they didn't know that the Earth was a globe, so it's impossible to read Genesis as talking about a global flood. It's just impossible to read that out of it. That, that that's just completely an anachronism. And in no place does anyone in history read it as a global flood until very, very recently. Um, like even when people figure out it's a globe, uh, it's a you know it's a, a global flood. If they ever consider, I'm sorry, there's a globe, and when they kind of see the Americas, if they ever think it's that, it's just because uh, just from a purely evidential point of view, you go high up on mountains and you see fossils of sea creatures, and you know not having modern geology, not having the whole picture. You know, you just might make a connection, not because it's important to you, but just because that seems like, oh, maybe that's what it was, right? It oh, was yeah, we've heard that word quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite a few times. What? We've heard that word quite a few times. Is a is a divide between two two cognitive landscapes, um, whereas uh, uh, you, Joshua, I'm just you, this is before people came out and saying, no, we've actually looked at geog you know, geology. The Earth looks old. That's not what it is. That's not the context that people were originally saying all this. They were saying they were seeing what appeared to be like evidence of stuff at the time. Yeah, that we and, know. And, and the reason why somebody like a Sedgwick, uh, devout uh, cleric and geologist who taught Darwin, had no difficulty with any of these things. But the the Ken Hams of the world, or Kent Hovins and the Young Earth creationists, they have a a, a much more rigid frame in yeah, which the second issue any that I think tiny helps. chink in the framework is lost or or treated as a metaphor or treated as an abstraction, suddenly, whoop, the whole thing disintegrates in their frame. Yeah, you know, but you know, Hugh Ross has a really helpful uh, point on this too. So what I'll point out too is like, that that's one problem, but the thing that makes 
Noah, I think that's actually very surmountable just because uh, that's actually not what Genesis teaches. Unequivocally, it's not what Genesis teaches. Um, but, this, but, but further evidence for this is that um, universal descent from Adam and Eve becomes theologically important um, in the New Testament. Uh, so when you want to know why people are fixating on this whole idea of Adam and Eve, it's not precisely Genesis. Often it's because what Paul is saying about it in Romans, in Corinthians, and, uh, and in Acts. So those three places, he makes uh, either direct or oblique references to Adam, and he's making an argument about stuff that is to support values that we actually care about. He's like arguing for things uh, that end up supporting notions like, you know, God actually cares about all people, not just Jewish people, not just one group. God actually, you know, that, that we all, I mean, that, all, that we all have, you know, uni there's universal rights and, you know, universal dignity, those sorts of things, which are things that we all care about. In fact, that's the reason why many religious communities reje rejected and resisted polygenesis when the scientific community went all whole hog for it. And so um, those are good things, even if we end up disagreeing with them, right? And that's all connected to the idea of descent from Adam. What's there's nothing comparable like that regarding Noah, like literally nothing like that comparing Noah. There's no important New Testament theology that Paul reasons from or any other like New Testament author reasons from to talk about important theology. So for that reason, that's why it's something that um, most, I would say, or many Christian leaders aren't actually as concerned about Noah being a bottleneck Oh yeah, that, that's quite true. Although over, it, it, I'll take the devil's advocate side uh, when you uh, the the young earth creationists take the point that since Luke has Jesus talking about as in the time of Noah and that there was a sin deck they, uh, from Adam and Eve that they put that into a very tight structural frame and then for them it's a seamless whole that you can't allow any variation. Yeah, but so, so they I have. Can, but, when, but yeah, but that's actually very easy to puncture through because everything you just said there is very much aligned with what they would say, except for. That could all be true. I mean, Noah could have been a real person. There could have been a regional flood um, that killed all the people that were visible in that area. That that flooded their entire world, which wasn't our entire world. Oh yeah, you Ross takes that position. There's an awful lot, of, and uh, intelligent designers don't usually fiddle too much about it. Bill Dembski kind of bumps into it from the aside. Uh, because uh, 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 apart from the young earth creationism part, theologically, he was much more comfortable with uh, rubbing shoulders with uh, Henry Morris than he was with Richard Dawkins. Yeah, so historically, the way how it actually developed for young earth creationism is they started out caring about Noah and the global flood. And then um, they added on, when they justify why this is so important, Adam and Eve becomes the scare factor. Um, so that's kind of how they work. So part of what the work I'm doing, I think why it's really important is that it really defangs that rhetoric. So I can give them everything that's important about Adam and Eve to them from their theological Well, point. with about 40% of the American population being young earth creationists, there are plenty of fangs to D here. <laughs> well, the thing is, about, like, I, can, I can give them everything that they think is important. And the one thing they have to give up on is the least tenable thing of it, which is the idea of there being, well, I'd say the two things. Well, yeah, I mean, you could say one thing, depending on how you want it. It's kind of combined. You know, are there people outside Adam's lineage or not? And if they can give on that, then, you know, and to be clear, like if you actually look at answers in Genesis because of Nephilim, they already do give on that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that started to pop up. And also in the Twitter uh, the the bottom feeding creationist that starts pops up in there. The, another one that I've been uh, uh, noticing for quite some time. I was waiting for it, and finally it started to happen. Is that the young earth creationists have to recognize that they have to move Egypt because the Egyptians don't have a global flood legend, and so in order to salvage their model, they've got to have all of Egyptian history, including all the pre dynastic stuff, rolled down past. Uh, the flood at 2350 BC or whenever they come with it. Well, I mean, I, I that, think, that's a mess. So I can't say exactly who this is, but I was talking to a, a very important old earth creationist um, leader, not Hugh Ross, but an important one, uh, who has deep ties at in institutions that are respected by young earth creationists and old earth creationists. It's kind of a middle ground place. And it was remarkable talking to him about this uh, at the Debar conference um, this last summer 
we were talking, and this is, I mean, I'm not going to give you his, his name, um, but he said, you know, what we really needed is a model that can compete with younger creationism, that can compete with answers in Genesis, like a biblical model that actually can do that. You know, what's, what's motivating him is actually a lot of the same concerns that I imagine really motivate you. There's a, a sadness that we see about like the injury being done to young people and to other people uh, that really um, disables them from engaging the grand questions that, in science and, and being able to participate in all this amazing stuff we're learning. Because, uh, you know, uh, because like, you know, people who are not trustworthy have done untrustworthy things and captured people with a story that has a posture to it. And uh, we, we don't want that to continue in the future. Um, yeah, I have we no don't problem want the science to be regarded as fake news. Yeah, but you know, but what if young earth creationism could actually just adapt to be something new in the future that is an anti-science where that will, I mean, frankly, you could even say Genesis is talking about the 6,000 year old creation of Adam's world, you know, 6,000 years ago, but there was a world outside of Adam's world. <laughs> well, from, from my from my source methods approach, I'll say that if they can give it a whack, but I would contend that they're never going to be able to accommodate most of the data field. <laughs> Well, I mean, I I would say that I think I think I actually have accommodated all the data field in this. No, no, not you, but the young Earth creationists. But I mean, I but if they can, I'm I'm telling you, there's young Earth creationists that can actually move to my model. So young Earth creationism is probably a misnomer. It's probably what we're going to use, but it's not actually hinging on the age of the Earth. It's not actually hinging on those things. It's actually a certain theological view and a certain way of reading scripture that you don't actually have to give up on. To come to terms with the evidence, um, I, I would say. But I mean, you have to give up on the age of the Earth. You have to give up on like a global flood. But those things aren't actually, I would say, central to the theology and 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 that. Does that make any sense? Well, so, I, I, I I just say is again as devil's advocate for the young Earth creationists, uh, uh, Kent Hovind and Ken Ham oh, would take a very different stance on that. Oh yeah, they <laughs> would. But I would just say that um, that uh, well. Look, I mean, I, I've presented this to large numbers of young earth creationists, and I've seen their responses. Um, one of the things that's actually really interesting is when they, they do that, they ask me questions, they'll probe me on questions about um, Romans 5, they'll ask questions about this and that. Very frequently, they'll, uh, the, the audience will be completely won over, actually, to not necessarily agreeing with me, but saying, oh, if that's what you believe, if that's what evolution is, I don't really have an objection to it. <laughs> and uh, they'll often articulate it directly that way. And then they'll turn to, I don't like how those other people are, right? Why become, you know, the ones that do it the right way. <laughs> I mean, the right way for them, right? And uh, in the leaders, I think it's been interesting. So I think there's a splitting that happens with a lot of leaders. So some of the leaders become really angry about this <laughs> and we can, can get very vicious with me, right? Um, because they're seeing that their community, um, and kind of like there's like a flip of switch uh, of, of the script that happened. I'm kind of brought in as an enemy to attack, as like the person who's clearly apostate and a her heretic and all that, but then I actually ended up winning people over, and they're not actually very happy with that. <laughs> but on the other hand, there's been a large number of young earth creationists that have taken a different view, where they're like, oh, you're one of us. <laughs> If, you know, we well, it, all, it all depends on which, which aspects they're concerned about. Uh, if uh, the focusing on Adam and Eve is one way of looking at it, uh, um, if you have a, a framework in which you also have to account for the reptile mammal transition, uh, then they might have a very different problem. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's like I'm saying that's not been there. I mean, that's like new. So like a person could accept that. I, I'm just telling you, I, I, I mean. I, I've seen people jump straight from young earth creationism to the, taking this point of view saying, oh, okay, so maybe that's how God created everything outside the garden and there's something else going on in the garden. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, they're not in conflict with science at that point. I mean, they're believing something that's in addition to science. I'm not trying to say it's a scientific point of view. Um, and, you know, maybe it's totally false. So I'm not even trying to make an epistemological case that it's correct. But I, I will definitely put my foot down and argue that it's not anti-science at that point. I mean, I think they're not they're not in conflict over those things. They're just accepting it had happened by something that's well described by evolution, right? <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, do you see that or no? Well, I, 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 um, uh, well, well the, the proof will be in the pudding as to uh, uh, what all the information is and how, how much of it's dealt with or not and uh, uh, what kind of models in that are put up. Well, I'd yes. love to be involved in a, in a discussion between you and me and a, and a young earth creationist to find out what common ground there is or is not to be well, found. You, know, in you could set that up, RJ. That would be phenomenal. You think you can? Oh uh, well, I'll, I'll we'll put the word out as to various people because there's a whole bunch of different communities of, of great debate and Peter and all uh, that where we have discussions on this and it, it'd be a fun one to thrash out Find, finding the the young earth creationist that can actually have a conversation as opposed to be doing a fixed debate. Uh, I I had one with Kent Hovind a little back uh, well, hey, a couple I'll of weeks ago. What, if you can get me on, was pretty, uh, get me on a, a, a conversation with Nathaniel Jensen, that would be very entertaining. Good yeah, luck with that. that that would yes, that would be most intriguing. Um, yes, mean, the, the non sequitur <laughs> show had to, you know, it took like months for that. that yeah, talk that was to Herman Mays, and I'll tell you yeah. what, like this is something that I think scientists. I mean, I, I saw that debate. Uh, Herman Mays actually showed up on our forum, and I mean, I think he's doing important work. I also really appreciate that he's not doing it as an anti-religious person. Um. Yeah, you know, in my opinion, I think uh, one thing that we don't give Ken Ham more and nearly enough credit from, and we don't learn from him enough on, is that he really understands rhetoric. I'd agree with that. I mean, I think he and uh, I think Kent Hovind's the same way. They're terrific at talking. Yeah, they, they understand rhetoric, and I'll tell you what, yeah. they run circles around. We were actually that was actually a comment a friend of ours made to RJ is that it's really hard to to beat nearly impossible to beat hovind at talking you know because but he I knows his material so well he's <laughs> he's so versed in it that it's really hard to get past that yeah so throw him off where, that, you know? i would just say that part of what's going on is it's not it's not actually about science um it's it, what's happening is it's actually a, a public theater that debate is Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Oh no, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and remember, uh, uh, Kent Hovind even more so than Ken Ham. Uh, Kent Hovind is a is a riveting uh, presenter, and he's had decades to hone this stuff. And he came up from a grassroots level. He didn't kind of come in running. He built up over many many years. Even though I regard him as an absolute travesty uh, as an analyst, but nevertheless, I, I I don't in any sense whatsoever minimize his ability to command an argument when uh, Dwayne Gish... Getting to, yes, this is getting to the issue where I think that um, it takes a really high level of communication ability and understanding of the young earth creationist audience, I mm -hmm. think, to be able to succeed rhetorically. Right. Yeah, and far more than getting merely people that know the science well, that's actually not that hard. Um, I think we need to start thinking about how to get better at rhetoric and start actually engaging them, you know, on equal terms there, instead of just seeding the rhetoric right from the beginning. And so that's actually partly how uh, I've been, not that I have it all perfectly figured out, but uh, to give you some objective things, I mean, you not, can't necessarily verify this, but it's true. And I've been invited to speak to homeschools groups, like large homeschool groups, mm -hmm. full of young earth creationists, and then invited back. <laughs> they like you enough to keep you around. <laughs> yeah, and I've had a, a, a leader of a Young Earth Creationist organization um, email me thanking me for my work. Well, this was true even uh, in, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name of the fellow. I, I've mentioned it in, in, in the text. Uh, he was investigating, um, I think in South Carolina, uh, creationists. Uh, back in the 1980s, and uh, he got along with them very well. He was accepted into their community as he was observing them for this sociological. I'm, I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about they'll actually have me be like headlining an event, mm -hmm. and like speaking and explaining my view to their children, and their children will sometimes even change their minds. Like. Well, Is keep us posted talking? on that. Well, we've got we've gone way past our uh, our time frame here. We've had a good hour of conversation. Oh, okay. uh, in addition to the rest of the things, I I hope you've enjoyed the sh the, the discussion. I hope the people in the in the well, live I chat. I hope I you, RJ. Watching. I was just letting you know about exciting stuff going on there. But yeah, we can mm -hmm. 
we can close it down. My wife will be happy about that. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah. It's, give it's, us feedback on things. And, and, um, and um, too. Yeah, and keep a keep a report on that and your own experiences on things. And I, I'm delighted to have you as a guest. And uh, and in future, if you ever want to have a discussion on things, and of course. We got to do that Jensen <laughs> Swamit ass downward <laughs> triptych. That would be that would be worth the price of admission. <laughs> yeah, you, you think that could happen? I mean, I know it took a lot. To I don't know, Jen, Jensen. I I, I uh, love engaging with people. I think conversation is something where you, if you have a view, you should be willing to defend well, it openly and honestly. And, RJ, and we I'm did fascinated. Get, we did get Mike Riddle on 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 my show, so it's possible. Yeah. I think. Yeah, well, he has always been an amiable, chatty sort. Uh, Jensen isn't quite so much, and there are quite a few other ones that are very difficult to get out of the shell. Uh, Andrew Snelling and others, there, there's a bunch of them in there where, where they yeah, kind of want to stay within the bubble. Well, the thing about it, too, is it doesn't have to be those guys. I mean, other people to consider is like Todd Woods or Kurt Weiss. Um, oh, Todd Wood, I would, and Kurt Weiss, either one of those, because they both like have paleontological, and they're, of course, involved in baromenology, which Jackson and I have been analyzing in various contexts so yeah that i'd love to i don't i've never they don't they aren't even on social media so if anybody's got a leg in to either one of them say hey uh come on evolution hour i've been imbibing a lot of bare mineralogical literature lately it's not good for your health <laughs> well you know i think look i think the way to approach it is instead of saying it's all madness the whole uh by the way is it okay we're going a little bit over time or or oh no that's fine yeah yeah so long as so long as we're not losing our audience here <laughs> but no, we haven't got any questions for them maybe we should start with that is there any questions yeah yeah come on are you just all gobsmacked at the way it's going on here <laughs> I, I don't know really if you recognize anybody recently. from your field uh from uh, the gang from uh uh, uh the, the science or dot org one uh, on that uh, or not. I, I see a bunch of familiar names from my end, so um, they apparently weren't following up. Sidestrike says, what a great show. Thanks, guys. And so that's a, a, a thumbs up. I think it, it's it's fun to get into discussion. And uh, I think the one area, of course, that I, I kind of disappointed on, we went more onto theology than into the technical uh, uh, side of it. That too. Uh, but, you know, I think I think part of what's going on is we're, we're actually finding out that there's actually a lot of common values and common ground here too, right, RJ? So. Oh, yeah. The, I found that, there are, that there, there's a tendency for a circle the wagon mentality, that you find people that they want to get into their camps and they fail to understand that actually they may share more things than they might otherwise have noticed if they don't start arguing. Uh, well, we saw that on Facebook this last week. That 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 Facebook post was brutal. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you get uh, you get some there. Um, the the bomb thrower anti theist uh, has a certain agenda that they want to deal with, and then the uh, oh, you uh, uh, lefty um, uh, uh, communist Marxists uh, coming from some of the camp in the young earth creationist tradition, and you're going, excuse me, but but it's 2018. Can't we move forward and, and discuss something a little more current? <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're in an interesting moment where I think, so here's one thing that does give me hope is if you actually start talking to people. So I, I, uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time building relationships with people at the Discovery Institute and in Intelligent Design. I spent a lot of time building uh, relationships with people uh, in uh, Reasons to Believe, uh, you know, the older Earth Creationist camp, too. Yeah, a dwindling breed uh, in terms of the, the anti-evolution demographic. Reasons to Believe, uh, that's... And, uh, uh, wait, time. who's the head of that one? Uh, Hugh Ross. Uh, Hugh Ross. You Ross, Fazal Rana. Okay. Uh, you, Ross, you Ross, I'll give him, I'll give, I constantly give him compliments uh, that of the various ones that are on Twitter, he will answer back way more frequently. You hell will freeze over before you will ever get a reply from uh, uh, Kent Hovind or Ken Ham. Uh, Ken Ham will block you right away. But no, a, uh, I've had a lot of chit chats. I did a Skype with uh, you, Ross, back in February. He never posted it on his website, unfortunately. I guess he didn't get something that was suitable for his apologetics. But but he's always been pleasant and uh, uh, agreeable to talk with on that. And and so the, the idea that tempers have to flare, no, they, they don't. Yeah, and, you know, I, I've, I've also talked to a lot of people, um, you know, in the in the Young Earth Creationist camp, like, like significant leaders. And I'll tell you, like, there's a common theme that keeps on coming up. I don't think anyone's happy with the current situation. That's kind of an ugly stalemate. No one's happy with it. 
Exactly. Okay. And moreover, people look out around in society, they see a fractured society where people are at odds and they're concerned about it. I think everyone is really concerned with the division they're seeing. Like everyone. I think it's really ripe right now. I mean, like I'm like I'm saying this and like you're nodding in the corner there, right? I think there's this. Oh, yeah, there's where, no, there's no yeah, doubt about it at all. all over here. We've got a polarization <laughs> that's scary. And so right uh, now, I think what's going on, and I think this is something for a moment where this is actually what I think I'm hoping peaceful science could be part of, but I think that uh, that I think we need a better way forward right now. I, th I, th I think I think kind of we're in a, you know, in a new generation. I think a new generation really wants a better way right now. And that's, that's, I think, going to get a lot of appeal across a lot of the divides right now in a way that maybe wouldn't have been the case even 10 years ago. Yeah, we, we've got um, a lot of interconnections with social media that weren't the case before. Another advantage of, that I love from the source methods direction is, wow, the degree to which this, the primary source material is directly accessible. It's way better than before. So, and, and, and one of the things that I'm constantly browbeating people on both sides of the fair is that, that when they do video lectures or other things, if they're discussing matters of fact where there is a source involved, give a link so people can follow up on it so that you don't have to take any of our word for things as the pundit. You can test our word against the technical field and do your own research and follow up and make it as easy as possible for people to do that. So even ones that where I've seen videos that are discussing systematic issues and that, that are, that are uh, very good in terms of their content, but there's no references to where they're getting their source data from so other people can follow up easily. And I think there's no excuse for that. In the they know what they're talking about and that's all that matters. Yeah. Well, yeah. You said you wanted to talk about some science. We don't have a lot of time left, but, but what can I help you out with that? We oh, actually have a oh. question from the audience on something science. Do well, your job, Jackson. Bring in the question. Well, I guess that's really, that's, well, that's not really. I just saw was the question. It, it's from old scratch, but it's not science related. It's yeah, theological. it's theological. <laughs> He's only we've only got theological questions in there, unfortunately. Anybody got any science questions in the live chat? Science. She blinded me. Oh, oh well, I'll, I'll I'll put up a, a question that intrigues me, and it was the same one that I was discussing with uh, Ann Gager, uh, which is uh, all those retrotransposons, and particularly ALUs. I think the last number that I was seeing is that 10% of the genome is ALUs. Most of them don't apparently have a function yet. They can easily acquire one by a, a, a start well, codon. Okay, so that, that's a, not quite correct, actually. So it depends how you measure it. So some measurements get up to around 40% of the genome, I think. Um, and when you mean by function, that, that's, the function is a very poorly defined term in biology. And so um, one uh, really interesting evolutionary mechanism that seems to evolve is that um, a lot of these, actually a very large number of these transposons, I have a colleague here at WashU that knows the exact percentage. He does work precisely on this, so I can go find out. So I'm going to get some of the numbers wrong here, but just understand I'm being called out off the top of my head, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Oh, sure. Uh, 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 and check with them. And when you get some source references and stuff, then you could put them into the to the video, uh, a comment on the video so people yeah, can follow so up Yeah, so it on. turns out a pretty large number, and I'll have to look if, if Alu is one of them, but I'm pretty sure it is. They actually carry promoters or are, or are DNA binding elements. I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. like enhancers or repressors. Or, uh, and the really big one is actually, uh, actually, once again, I have to look up these things, but there's a key transposon that carries um, something that binds uh, what actually causes the, the 3D structure um, in, in DNA uh, and to kind of create regulatory units within, uh, within the chromosome. I'm, I don't know how much science you guys know to know if this is going to make sense to you. Are you guys following what I'm saying or do you need to explain more? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, the, and so that actually can bounce around a lot. And it actually makes it so it can be very functional. And it can oh, make yeah, it there, I, I found a lot of instances where ALUs have become functional. But from my understanding is that, that it does, after all, have to have 
a, a start codon kicking in and that in some cases it produces bad effects because there are quite a lot of diseases that come about from it. But particularly with brain chemistry, apparently this took place quite a ways back, uh, uh, possibly. Well, into like the, I said, uh, it's a very complex, uh, it's, it's a very complex picture is all I'm saying. And some mm -hmm. of it is not actually what you're talking about where you need a start codon because it would just change the overall 3D structure of the DNA. So it would just change mm -hmm. gene expression. And so one of the safest ways to um, create variation is not by evolving a new gene or mutating a gene, but to just change uh, how that gene is expressed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, one I, of the I, I don't disagree about that. Is that, you know, it may not actually require uh, evolving any new, you know, protein enzymes, for example, to get between a human and a chimpanzee. It's just yeah. a lot of ways, for the most part, it's like a first approximation. It's like we're made up of the same. Lego building blocks, maybe a couple reshaped in a few different ways, right? Yeah, it's like even the the origin of the phyla that uh, uh, Steve Meyer will toss around the idea, oh, all of the new genetic information required for that. And I kind of go, what new genetic information? It looks like there's a whole bunch of things that were already doing varieties, and now you get the new shuffling that's going on and, and that explosion in the Cambrian after the Eddie Akara system fell apart. Yeah, so what, that, that, that's the surprising thing is, I mean, like, you know, it's, it like all this stuff. It's, I mean, it, it's just, it, just function is just very poorly defined in biology. I mean, you cannot say very many precise things about it. Um, it's basically an after the fact thing, and yeah, it's as more you're, like a, enough to be able to the whole like you know uh, encode junk DNA madness and the pseudo history involved in that arises, but yeah. I mean, I, I think yeah, transcription doesn't mean it's being used for something. The, another uh, a, a test case that I'm intrigued with, and I've, uh, I've, there hasn't been a heck of a lot done on it yet because they don't know enough to be able to do it yet. But there's been a few things of it, is the paleogenomic reconstruction of the Ediacara biota. That one of the things that if I can live long enough, it will be, did Ediacara biota occur because they had homeobox genes or did they have some completely offshoot system of formal structure out of that. I'm betting that homeobox are involved, but as because but yeah, the structures I mean, that you see that just, we may not be able to I mean it, I mean that's a phenomenally interesting question. It just might be outside the, the street light though. You know what it, you yeah, know, it may indeed be. Street, right? Although I, even within my own lifetime to get to the point I, I covered a lot of, of the paleogenomic examples in, in evolution slam dunk, uh, the bit where they've uh, 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 rudimentary things like retro engineering the various mutations of the cusp forms on rodent teeth that included extinct forms that they had seen uh, going back 100 million years that aren't in any extant form or uh, um, retro engineering the, the, the um, uh, archosaur skull that is the the, the snout that's forming the bird beak. The thing that was so fascinating about it is there was a bit of a kerfuffle because the two genes that they were manipulating, only one of them was one that had previously been implicated. The other one was one that, that they hadn't realized might be connected up with the formation of bird beaks. So we're constantly discovering all these new little bits and pieces of things. But the amount of paleogenomic work that's been done just within the last 10 or 15 years blows my mind away as to how much progress has been done. Yeah, but you're, I mean, I agree with you. There's a lot being learned, but you're talking about going from, um, you know, where we are now uh, to, the, to actually the earliest possible animal that isn't even fully established as being an animal. I didn't tell you that it was going to be easy, Joshua. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible. So there's a difference between difficult and not possible because it's outside the streetlight. Yeah. Jackson has to go bye-bye. He's got uh, a school and stuff to deal with there in, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, yeah, there are some that are probably technically too difficult to pull off, but I'm still rooting for it. Um, the um, uh, uh, the original... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the, there, are, uh, there are a lot of little fascinating issues that pop up in um, 
the biological area and paleontological areas uh, that are just intriguing. That th theoretically, paleogenomic analysis can uh, ferret out things. I mean, obviously, they were starting with just uh, the, um, uh, the structural genes because that was the most obvious stuff. Now, just beginning to deal with those cis regulatory levels to try to ferret back all the way up to those homeobox body patterning genes where tiny mutations generally screw everything up to try to peel back the, the big question mark that I, I put a bunch of things in my little kit bin of origin of life questions that aren't usually included in the subject matter. So it's not just how did the uh, codon system uh, assigning with different amino acids uh, occur and whether there was a duplex system before triplex, things like that. But also the whole error correction system that occurs in the genome. How do you manage to, to remove mistakes and correct for them? I, those things just scream stuff that, that, that you need to account for in order to work out the model. Um, so what's the, sorry, I was just answering some of, I, mean, I was actually talking to the commenting people, but what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, it, it, I was just saying that, that uh, for me in my, uh, I have a whole uh, um, uh, column uh, in how I categorize the science technical literature and who's paying attention to what that relating to origin of life questions. And my stuff not only is the more overt thing about what's going on to produce LUCA uh, or whether or not how far removed was that from any precursor systems and RNA worlds and PNA and all the different variables that might be relevant into that lipid formations and all that. But for me, an origin of life question is also how did the error correction systems develop? The things that, mm. that monitor to find out why a, a, a codon is out of place or not. Uh, all of those things are just, just scream interesting subject matter that I want to know how those things originated. So I put them on the sideline as well, uh, along with the um, uh, a matter of how the codon system developed, uh, how much variation is going on. Um, we know that the mitochondria seem kind of prone to reassignments of codons, and so what was the original codon system? Uh, and then the big- Oh, well, mitochondria, we know more about that. You know that, right? Oh yeah, they, they, there's, they've got even somewhere, there's some that are in transit, that they're starting to reassign to a new uh, amino acid and they can each actually see the mutations involved. It's as slow as molasses process, but nevertheless, you know, you've got, look at much, how much time has been going on with mitochondria uh, for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh... I think it's exciting. I mean, I think science is really a beautiful thing. It's like, it's like, it's one of the great things. So most of the scientists who have ever lived are currently alive. And the amount of science work that's been done is gobsmacking. I mean, I, when I was a little teeny kid, the idea that I would live to a time when they are now discussing the possibility of having detected a moon of a planet orbiting an extrasolar system that that would be observable with our instruments is something where I'd be going, yes, keep it coming. <laughs> I think that's the right idea. So, I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to do is just try and find ways to welcome more and more society into it. Um, yeah, yeah. So th there was a lot of uh, theological questions in the feed. I'm not going to divert that way, except for to say, um, uh, I'm not being irresponsible on all that stuff. I'm working actually, there's actually a large number of theologians that are starting to engage the work that I'm putting forward. I'm in the middle of writing a book on this right now too. So if you go to peacefulscience.org um, and, uh, and you uh, look at the stuff there, you'll start to see links to, to, to things that that, that's, that, that website's gonna be developed more in the near future. And then also our forum. So if you go to our forum, which is discourse.peacefulscience.org, um, I'm happy to, to uh, answer questions. And also a lot of the people there are really, you know, gathering around that, that, those questions too. I mean, I think they're important questions. I'm not dodging them. It's just that I'm trying to not make this all about it. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me, you know, the things that are going on in theology, them can be fighting words. And so uh, uh, the, the whole bit of where uh, I try to pick my discussions carefully so as not to make... Uh, a big issue about some things that are, are not so relevant as other things. Uh, 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 I often advise uh, uh, atheists, for example, that uh, uh, don't try to argue that Jesus was mythical, that, <laughs> that, it, it, that there's, you don't need to do that to have a discussion here. And it's one that, that gets into slippery slope historical areas where if you start being Parsi, 
it's hard to determine that Alexander the Great was real. If you well, want to get more, like, atheists tend to be very good about science um, and caring about science well. But I'll tell you what, man, I've seen so much pseudo history among uh, amongst atheists. Not all atheists, of course, but many atheists. Like totally ridiculous pseudo history that I think maybe they may have read one or two books well, on the subject. What? Um, what? What was that? They may have read a few books on the subject and now they think they can deal with it. But it's the same source methods that would be applied is that what, it doesn't matter what you are reading or who you're reading. You should want to find out whether or not they've got a good source base, how much of it is primary source material. If it's primary source material, it's accessible. Can you get to it to check out and measure them to see how reliable they are? And uh, um well, it's it's that's, the same that's game. True, but I guess I'm a little bit of a different situation because I mean I'm a scientist, so I'm not going. I mean, stuff, the questions I'm really interested in, there is no sources. I have to go collect the data, ask the question. Oh, true. Oh, yeah. In the science area, yeah, you're literally exploring the field and figuring out what the, what the development was. Uh, but uh, in in matters of history, that was my gig. My BA is in history. Uh, there, you have that track record of historiography of how different historians have yeah, dealt with yeah. it at the time. Yeah, and a lot of that, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah, there's this issue where I'd say, like to be clear, I wasn't talking about all atheists. I was talking about, um, I would say, like you know, if if fundamentalist Christians have a problem with pseudoscience, I'd say a lot of new atheist type, you know, there are there are some yes, and I slap their wrists on some of these things uh, that... Uh, I think what's and, going and on every... is actually, where we have a really big problem is when we're trying to make an argument uh, that was already predetermined before we came there. So um, like a polemic argument, like when we're polemicists mm. rather than scholars, yeah. we're setting ourselves up for massive cognitive bias when we look at things. And yeah, and so I I, I, I want uh, everybody to play on a rigorous field as much as possible. The one difficulty, ironically, we're in a weird situation when it comes to some of these things because now it's to the point where the technical literature is more readily accessible than an awful lot of the historical scholarly literature. That's true. Uh, archaeological material, uh, stuff on uh, uh, ancient monuments and epigrams and the like. The literature is there in hard copy, but it's not stuff or that books can be rather than articles. Exactly. Yeah. And so, if it isn't in a book, uh, uh, in the in the creation evolution example uh, is one that pops up in regarding that reptile mammal transition that I wrote slam dunk on that. On the intelligent design side, almost all of their opinions on the subject are in books. They've done absolutely nothing online. Young Earth creationists have a smattering of stuff online, that truth in science and some Dwayne Gish stuff and John Woodmer app and answers in Genesis. And so it's a situation where if somebody is coming into an issue like that and they're going to try to find what's online, there's a kind of a narrow box that they could hit that would be probably irrelevant to what they want to deal with. But the, from the historian end of it, yes, it just pisses me off when I'm trying to find out some little bit about um, uh, a, a matter like um, the, the historiography of the belief in a globe birth and just exactly how that fitted in to um, uh, the theology in the Middle Ages, that there's bits and pieces on it, but most of it's in book level, not relating directly to the primary source scholarly work. And that bothers me. I, I, I want to be able to glom onto the primary sources. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, I've, I've, through this whole thing on Adam, I've become friends with a lot of theologians, a lot of philosophers, and a lot of exegetes. That's a fancy word for a person who interprets Yes, the yes, we want to. Well, it, it's always good to throw around a good word. What? <laughs> yes. And also a lot of historians, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's been interesting talking to them and learning about their fields. I mean, uh, you know, just because a person's an expert and knows a lot about science doesn't mean they know a lot about, you know, ancient Near Eastern literature or, you know, all, or like, you know, what is actually a reasonable standard of evidence, you know, for 2000 Well, and, and of course, history, unlike the sciences, has one horrible difficulty that the scientist doesn't have to worry about. It's that your data field can lie to you. Yeah, I would agree. That's true. Um, well, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, yes, you're right. But I'll tell you too, like, I mean, that happens in biology all the time. 
too. I mean, we're oh, well, the, well the, yes, the, every, any a scientist can manipulate the data field and, and that, but but the molecules themselves won't be doing the lying. Here, the primary source, when you look at... at well, oh, lying is a very anthropomorphic term, right? but I, I think a better way to put it is it can be very misleading. Yeah, and so in, in some ways, um, uh, getting more people to pay attention to how historians do their job actually prepares you for a bit better understanding of the scientific process because you appreciate the human side of it. You appreciate how the, there will be fashions in particular viewpoints, uh, the, 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 the old debates that went on between Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins back in the 1970s that were re and, and uh, E.O. Wilson that were reaching the point where people were throwing water on each other and getting into, into real altercations, that, that that needs to be appreciated when you just look at from a distance where the discussion was, yeah, there was a social context to that too. And that's a historical analysis. Yeah, and, and I think I think part of it, you know, I'll tell you the young creationism stuff, helping them understand the history of it is very helpful. I mean, that's actually, so I was raised young earth creationist. There were several pieces of my path to leave it. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest ones is when I realized that what I was told was the traditional historical interpretation of Genesis was nothing like it. That's not what it was. And, yeah. and so uh, that like kind of gave me freedom to realize that, oh, that's just what you guys came up with and are calling traditional, but that's not actually what it is. <laughs> so I'm actually allowed yeah, to Yeah, and questions. so I'm, I'm always, uh, when I get into discussions uh, I, uh, on Twitter, uh, uh, I like to find out what frame they're coming from. People can bandy around terms way too casually to where I've heard full-blown creationists say, oh, I believe in evolution. I have no problem with evolution. And what they mean is m that little limited micro evolution that they've read in their creationist thing. And you only find that out when you ask some questions about it. So uh, uh, what terms people use and the context in which they use them, you ask questions to find out where they're coming from and place them on a landscape of belief and, and knowledge. Uh, otherwise you can talk past each other just endlessly. So RJ, I got to tell you, this is uh, this has been fun. You know, I um, this is the first uh, live cast I've ever done. Did you know that? <laughs> oh well, jump in. Yeah, I, I I'm taking the attitude. That I'm the old fart here, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, it'll be interesting to see. I'll, I'm really curious to see if you can set up a, a dialogue. I don't call it a debate, but like a dialogue. Yeah, I I don't like those. Although there are some like uh, uh for years I'd wanted to have an interaction with Kent Hovind. And Hovind only would do debates. And I finally was able to get one. And uh, even though it was the fixed debate format, I did what I needed to do. And I don't think Kent is ever going to want to be in the same room with me again. But that's uh, that's another side affair. But, but the conversation end of it, the discussion end of it, to where you can step back. Frankly, even the little interaction that I had with Michael Denton uh, uh, just yesterday was much more interesting than you would get from afar where people are just talking about their little rope positions. You find out that, that people's views are often way more intricate and their, uh, and their awareness of things have many more things that we can connect up to. And we only find that out in a conversation, not a browbeating debate. Hey, like I'll tell you what, you set up any uh, dialogue on your podcast or someone else's where people will be treated with respect. Um, no matter what side they're coming from, I'll, I'm I'm game for that. So yeah, and, I and people and in the word around your network, network on there that anybody that wants to uh, come on as a guest on the show and in the kind of context to discuss interesting subjects that there that the prime rule is there is no subject that cannot be discussed in a reasonable, pleasant manner. It doesn't mean you have to leave your beliefs at the door and not defend your position, but you can still, you can discuss it in a gentlemanly manner or gentle personally. I think we need to be non-sexist on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think, like I said, it'll be interesting to see uh, how this shapes up. I mean, so, you know, like I, I have connections across, or I'm, I'm known really across all the groups. Um, yeah. So, like I said- if you Anybody can that can do a, a Google I'm Hangout, sure. Uh, that's the the bit, and uh, all subjects are open for discussion. Um, if you look through my website, you'll find I traipse into a lot of areas. I'm not shy about what my viewpoints are or on what basis that I do them, but I'm also genuinely fascinated by about um, the, the discussions that I found up with atheists who are ex-Christians, and I'm curious about why they did the path they did. I'm from a different background. You're an ex-Young Earth creationist, so I immediately wanted to know more about that background because we find out about that 
vast network of social connections and why we come to be the way we are and how we change our minds, that comes from conversation. Well, that's great. So yeah, once again, thanks a lot for your time. Um, and Indeed, we went, went a tad over the thing, but hopefully we didn't borrow, uh, uh, we, we wore poor J Jackson out. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I hope you guys have me back sometime. This is this is yeah, yeah, and fun. and you got an open invitation, Joshua. It sounds good. How about the next time an uh, interesting controversy arises? We'll, we'll oh yeah, yeah. Whenever if if uh, Cornelius Hunter uh, 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 lights into you or something like that, you know, we can do uh, 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 any uh, matter on that. You know, the but, yeah, in the last two months, the Discovery Institute published thirteen articles about me. Oh, they 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 tend to be a kind of anal retentive uh, variations. So you'll have uh, a, a, one of their writers will post a complaint, and then they'll have Evolution News have that, and then David Klinghoffer will come in and make a comment on it. And so you get this kind of swirling bulga base of uh, of uh, self referential. Thirteen in just two months, and I think it was like fifteen if I go back to three months or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, before Casey Luskin, if you remember Casey Luskin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he uh, I have heard rumors from uncorroborated sources that he had kind of a falling out with them because he handled some lecture badly and he did, and they didn't like that. So he's disappeared off the scope completely. But in my own data field, in my tip research, 14% um, of the entire intelligent design literature is just Casey Luskin. <laughs> it's that big. I've got like about four or 500 of his citations in there. And he's had a baneful influence on Gunter Beckley. Uh, who's uh, recently became a religious convert, and he's their in-house paleontologist now, and he's basically picking up the Casey Luskin-style arguments now, and I go, oh, no, no, you've got to do way better than that. I had a pretty good article on the endocardiology or whatever you pronounce it. Um, I mean, it had it had some obligatory, like, you know, ID arguments, but it wasn't actually, um, like, like anti, I mean, it wasn't accusing anyone. It was, there was no ad hominems in it. It was actually substantive. Um, if you just ignore those like one or two paragraphs, you actually learn something about some of the real controversies about whether or not it actually is an animal or not. So I think that's- Oh yeah, although the, the latest one there with uh, Dickinsonia and that the fact that they've been finding uh, uh, trace elements that are, are an indicator of that. And also the indication that some of them move. Uh, I'm betting that they're more likely to be a, a homeo box based thing. Oh, that was the thing that I was going to say before is that one of the things uh, that I got my brain fart uh, that one of the areas that I put a big question mark, a follow-up, follow-up, follow-up that I keep a real close eye on is proto-HOX. That's one that is all having to be done by, by retro engineering because all we have are the HOX complex and the para-HOX complex. And there's a you lot know, of tantalizing you know Do you actually have a file on me? I'm just curious. Oh, I have. Well, I put most of the sources up as the links. Uh, I've got um, uh, 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 hold your horses, uh, Joshua. In my reference base, I've got fifty-seven thousand sources, of which eighty-eight hundred are anti-evolution sources, and over twenty-five thousand are technical papers. And I'm tracking uh, um, about twenty-three hundred anti-evolution writers, and uh, something I think it's just skirting close to sixty-seven thousand of the scientists who are the ones that have done those technical papers. I keep track of all of this stuff because I'm measuring, no one's ever done this before, uh, uh, measuring actually what technical sources are cited by anti-evolutionists and whether it's being done in terms of just authority quoting, that's what I've been doing with this contested bone and the bones have analysis. Have you ever thought about doing some, uh, have you ever thought about uh, doing some uh, big data analysis on that? Oh, I, I, I'd love to in due course uh, on it. I, I'm in effect, doing the very rudimentary level because what I've done is to separate out into primary categories. Uh, so there's a, the biological section, there is biogeography, there is uh, speciation systematics issues, uh, there's origin of life, there's cosmological issues, uh, human evolution, cognitive oh, yeah, neuroscience. You got to be able to get them into a format where, uh, where a computer can read it. So mm, yeah, yeah, that I'd probably have to have an assistant on that go through that. Uh, oh, and, and as somebody with yeah, um, let me think about it. Maybe we can even get a grant for it. We'll see. Oh, oh, I love grants. I'm a social security retiree person. I've got my GoFundMe. I've got little trickles of stuff from my book royalties and all of that. But uh, I'm basically a one. Well, so you know, I'm kind of curious. If somebody else have sent me your my file, so I can tell you. I, I don't actually think you have all the key articles from me, but. Um, 
It'll be oh, oh, I, um, uh, I think that's in very, very possibly the case. Uh, I, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that I, I'm, I'm just scratching the surface of certain issues. But that's why I'm on social media. That's why I'm on Twitter, connecting up with people. Is that they fill me in on things that I would not have known because even as it is, I've got like 1,900 technical journals that I've drawn on over the years. It's there's not enough time in the day to monitor all of those things. So, so you find have to find ways of of, of jump starting the process so that you can find out the data field uh, in a way that is faster than looking through every technical journal that's ever been done. Hmm. Uh, they quoted a really interesting uh, Twitter for me. This might be a good way to end. Uh, <laughs> May uh, 31st, uh, science isn't here to confirm your intuitions. It's here to challenge them. Which I think is true. Yeah, science yeah. Or, or the other way is that science is the is the organized way of exploring our ignorance to try to figure out what actually is. So thank you so much for having me, RJ. I got to get back to real life. And thank you, thank you for being on. We went way over the show times, but I don't think it was a waste of time. I think we had a very good discussion. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll be back. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. <laughs> okay, stopping the broadcast. Bye.